time for Wednesday's hour number two on Hashtag Daily K with your host, Peter Bint. Korean dramas, movies and e- even lyrics. Why is the world paying attention to Korean stories? From classics to modern masterpieces, time to dig deep into the charms of Korean literature. On Check It Out with Paul. Every Wednesday, Paul comes into the studio to. What do you do? What do you Have do? Have you forgotten what I do? I like your beard, Paul, this week. It's looking handsome. Thank you. Uh, what do you do, though, apart from bring your beard? I bring in books. He brings in I bring beards in stories and, and poetry and all sorts. Beards, books. What else can we squeeze in there? Bravado. Bravado. Brotherly love from mm. time to time. Bluffing. Um, blindingly good jokes. Yeah, well, blindingly good is a matter of opinion. And also a lot of... Oh, I can't squeeze in another B. I brought in, Paul, some crisps today from yeah. the UK. Skips, they're called. Prawn cocktail. Light and melty, they say. Um, and I found out for the first time, you don't eat flavoured crisps. No. I, I, I'm ready salted. From a young age? Yep. Yeah. Never really? like them. Never, never get on with them. Wow! I'll, I'll go. I'll, I'll go even worse. And this will shock some people. <gasps> okay. I do. I, ha- I have never eaten ketchup. I have never eaten mayonnaise. Wait, wait, wait! Not you don't like it. You've never eaten either of those. Oh, things. I may have done it okay. unknowingly, but but okay. no, no, no. I've never liked them. Never wanted oh, to eat them. Wow! Uh, mustard, if it's whole grain in a meal, yes, but no squeezy yellow mustard on anything. Not even English Coleman's no. kind of spicy mustard. Never, never done. <gasps> Whole grain is okay. That's like a well, no, oh, you no, don't love it, though. no, no. Okay. I, I don't. I hate condiments. Oh wow! Yeah, wow, that is unbelievable. Because to be a true working class Brit, you surely have to put ketchup on everything. That's no. my. <laughs> that was never. We never had. We never had ketchup in the house. Yeah, you guys lived in Abingdon, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, what about instead of skips? Shall I give you my banana? Because I feel bad now. No, I have no a banana. I'm, oh, I'm fine. Okay. I've All had right. some nuts. Would you like some do you? I've also got some old do you in no. a vinyl packet. Peter, I'm really fine. It's okay. it's okay. I was just trying to spread the brotherly love. Okay. Uh, Look, I... this, well, speaking of love. Yes. Oh. You happy, know what it is next week. Happy, well, nearly Black Day. March no. 14th. It will be nearly Black Day. No, what? What is March 14th? What? But it's not March 14th next No, but what is 13th. March 14th? Black Day, no? April 14th is Black oh, sorry, Day. White March day. 14th is White Day. Oh, dear. Okay, so... so next Thursday yeah. is the day when men traditionally in Korea will give things to the ladies. Okay, so yeah. I should give you something next Well, no, Wednesday like, like um, last month, mm-hmm. the week before Valentine's Day, I brought in a story that was anti-Valentine's Day. Oh, fantastic. So, so this might week, be that. I've got something that's anti-White Day. Something that's, um, well, about failed love. Wow. OK, before we get into okay. that, Tiggerish says, uh, you also come in for laughs and bickering banter. B- bickering banter, yeah, oh, I'll go for that. that's good. But he asked the very crucial question, do you then enjoy gravy? I love a good gravy. Okay, because that... gravy doesn't fall under condiment. No, no, it? gravy is a sauce. Yeah. And I'm all for a properly handmade sauce. Okay. And I make my own gravy. Yeah. Make a delicious gravy. Because you, you can't have a roast dinner without gravy. You did tell me that you make your own, and I was really taken aback by that, because mm. I've always had granules. Of course, Mum being Korean, she didn't know how to make a witch first I got there. But I just, it's a guilty pleasure, the granules ones. I, I, have, no, I have no problem with people liking that, because I understand it's a fuss to make proper gravy. Paulina has pulled you up, and I was oh. going to say this, but oh, no. I didn't want to. Oh, no. Ketchup is tomato sauce in the UK, isn't it? That's what we call nope, it. No, nope, nope, a say... tomato sauce would be a sauce made with tomatoes. Ketchup is a condiment. <laughs> I will I will die on this hill. Yeah, I think some American friends, when we ask for some tomato sauce, they get a bit confused. They do say, yeah, well, that's not the definition of a sauce, but some Brits call it that. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go even one step further, Peter. I'll... I don't eat pickles. 
We don't eat pickles. I'm not a massive fan of pickles. I'll let you off on that one. So here in Korea at like pasta places when they bring out the pickles. I just say stuff. take them away. Really? I do. Take them away. Get them out of my <laughs> face. Uh, lovely stuff. Well, Paul is here every week and we yeah. do dive into some random topics. But the main uh, hub of this operation is the checks, which yeah. uh, stands for books. And it's anti romance. And the so, romance today. What I've got today is a short story um, mm-hmm. from one of Korea's most prominent authors. We featured her last year um, because an anthology was released. The mm-hmm. anthology was called The Age of Doubt. The Korean title was Bul Shin Shide. Um, the author's name is Park Kyung Ni. And it was translated by a number of authors. We looked okay. at the title story last January, uh-huh. and that was translated by Anton Her. Okay. Today we're looking at a story translated by Sophie Bowman, and it's called... The sickness no medicine can fix. Oh, that's a curious title, yeah. isn't it? The so it's a, it's a tale of love that wasn't meant to be in a marriage that should never have been. Oh, okie dokie. Reminds me of the Korean film I watched recently. Uh, I can't remember what it was in English now, the title. Literally 30 Days. I don't know if you've seen this on D Plus at the moment, so if you want to check it out. Okay, is it good? It's a rom-com, you know, so take it with a pinch of salt. But it is about a marriage that maybe shouldn't have been, and then they try and get a divorce, and then they both lose their memories. You know, they give them like a one-month period of just think about it. So that one month, they've completely blanked their memories, and they kind of fallen back in love. I love those kind of I have to say, the most recent Korean rom-com I watched was Honey Sweet. Was that good? It was lovely. Oh, Yoo Hae Jin is a fabulous actor. Oh, and you wouldn't you wouldn't mark him as a romantic lead. He's the lead. He's the romantic lead wow. in this movie, and it's absolutely brilliant. It's for us who are in our forties. Okay, all right. <laughs> that will... includes you, Peter. It absolutely <laughs> includes me. Now, uh, tell us a bit about this famous, fabulous author. Yeah, she was a huge author in Korea, Park Kyung Ni. She was born in South Gyeongsang Province um, back in the nineteen twenties. Had a bit of a hard life. Her father left immediately after she was born. Um, And so books became her comfort. Books were the thing that she relied on, you know, going through the turbulent years of Japanese occupation, then through the Korean War. Um, The really sad thing was her husband was branded a communist and ended up dying in prison. Mm. Her son died at the age of three. And she was left with a young daughter and she had to look after a mother and so it was really tough of course and then uh, just before her 30th birthday she started writing professionally um and she she became this really really well loved author um the most famous book i think is toji the land which ah. is this serial serialized novel okay. that sort of looks at colonialism and the struggles of ordinary people but this collection the age of doubt is really fantastic because you get you get um, I, I think it's about 8 or 9 of her representative stories and they're all brilliant and they all are a great reflection of korean society at various times oh, fabulous i uh, have to check out more stories maybe from this collection i don't know if we've ever visited a short story collection before more than once i'm not gonna say it might be you can do your research you can find out for yourselves okay he doesn't know either tell us about (laughs) the translator then please Uh, sophie bowman we have featured her before i think this is our maybe our fifth time nice um Often we've visited her science fiction translations ah, yes. as well as one classic work. Um, and she's brilliant. My favourite has to be the brilliant crow translation she did with Song Liu of Kim Bo Young's I'm Waiting for You, uh-huh. um, which if you haven't read yet, why not? Please buy it. Please mm. rent it. Please borrow it from the library because it's a brilliant, brilliant book, a brilliant translation. So uh, a very reliable translator, a very good translator. I don't know why, if this is related or it's just random, uh, Paulina saying, guy, oh, OK, <laughs> we came back to the source debate. I thought it was related to the translator okay. and author. What is guacamole? <laughs> Uh, guacamole is um, a topping, a topping, a topping or a dip. Uh huh. Now, I I have to say, I was I was not keen on guacamole Ooh. until I had it in a Mexican restaurant here, and I had it with other things. Because okay. on its own, I went, Man, this doesn't really doesn't doesn't do it for me. Not that flavorful. But as it, part know. of a sort of a spicy chorizo taco, oh, that was. Brilliant. Now yeah. I now I now I'm a fan of guacamole. Absolutely. If you're eating Mexican food with all the other bits and bobs, like you said, it's perfect. Yeah, but no ketchup on the guacamole. Oh, a bit of salsa though. A bit of tomato oh, salsa. Now I like a salsa because a salsa is not a condiment, it's a salsa. There we go. Uh okay, so we're gonna jump into this story. 
in uh with with white day in mind next week this anti is, anti white anti, day anti white day <laughs> maybe gearing up for black day in april where the singles get together okay so we're starting at the very beginning at the very beginning of the story no introduction needed Yonggi was smoking, crouched in the yard thick with fumes from the mosquito fire. A breeze filtered through the loose weave of his hemp work clothes, but far from cooling him off, the muggy air only made him hotter. The thick smoke rising from the mosquito fire caught in his throat and made him cough, but he kept on sucking at his pipe. Having been bent over in the rice field all day weeding, his back was stiff and his limbs ached. But Yongi's exhaustion was far more tolerable than the effort it was taking to control his urge to run to the tavern at the fork in the road on the way to the town marketplace. Who knows whether she might change her mind, Yongi thinks. All sorts of men frequent that tavern. Surely a few will be better looking than me. And there will be travelling salesmen with fine fortune and men without a woman at home already. What have I ever done for Walsun anyway? I bet there are plenty of fellas going around with an eye for her. Feeling anxious, like there was a great weight pressing down on his chest, Yongi stood abruptly and then sank back down again. He tapped the tobacco ash out of his pipe, refilled and lit it. No matter how stifling, how unbearable these feelings were, there was nothing Yongi could do. Maybe he could steal away with Wosu off deep into the mountains without even the mice or birds knowing and survive cultivating a slash and burn plot. He could think of no other way for them to be together. Since the night of the player's performance, Yongi had gone to Wolsun in the middle of the night a few times over and now he was sure he couldn't live without her. The feel of her silky soft skin and her deep scent always smouldered around him and this was the only thing that made him certain. He was alive. About ten years before, when Walsun left the village following a man from far away, Yongi hid behind a heap of barley straw and watched her back as she went. Something hot streamed from his eyes, but he had long since thrown away any hope of being with her. As he turned away, he repeated to himself, Have a good life, wherever you go. Uh, this hairy widow is Paul Matthews, or maybe Peter Bint. I don't know. Maybe you're not that know. hairy. I don't know. I what, wish you. I wish you'd grow a beard. What's under this top? It could be reams of hair. The Who public knows? have a right to know. <laughs> Absolutely, they demand it. Uh, I can't grow a beard like Paul, unfortunately. So I'm a little confused in that reading. So I'm not surprised. It talks about Yongi um, thinking about this girl, I assume, Wo's son, and wanting to be with her. And then the really bit that got me was, and then it rewinds 10 years ago, and Wo's son left the village. So is he like remembering the times when Wo's son was in the village? Or has she returned? She's come back. She's not a girl. He's not a boy. Okay. He's an Ajoshi. Oh, okay. You know, they're, they're, they're not young anymore. They're past it. So the nights when he would go and that's visit now. her. Oh. She has come back after 10 years. Oh, so that's good. That's good, except he's married. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. That's uh, definitely not his good. His wife, Jung Nim, or Jung Nim Dek, is at home, ah. um, and he's having an affair with her. Is Wosun still with the man from far away? No, she's come back to town, and she's running the tavern now. Ah. Yeah, and, um, yeah, and they were in love a long time ago, but mm-hmm. his mother was like, you are not marrying Wosun. I'm oh. telling you now, you will not marry that girl Why? because her mother's a mudang, oh. her mother's a shaman, okay. and I will not have you marrying a mudang's daughter. Ah, okay. So, a few days before, she's back, the love's rekindled. She he's, knows he's married, I assume. Yeah, okay. and he's sneaking off to see her. Um, and so he's thinking about her and he's, you know, oh, you know, what am I going to do? Yeah. I, I like her, but does she really like me? And then his friend Chilsung bumps into him and he's like, you know, a neighbor's uh, slaughtered a dog. You know, they're having a bit of a party. Okay. And he's like, mm, I think there's going to be some booze there. Oh. So off they go. Okay. Uh, having a good time. Um, 
he knows his wife is jealous and is angry and knows about the affair because oh. um, uh, previously in the day she threatened him with a knife. Oh, that would so, be a good sign. That not she's going angry. well. So he's okay. thinking, I'd rather go to the neighbours, have a few drinks, <gasps> than face her at home. Okay, he sounds like a terrible husband. Not the greatest. <sighs> no. Meanwhile, his wife, Jung, Jung Nim, is at the Duman family house, you know, having some tea, having some food, yep. and getting to an argument with Turtle's mother. Okay. Um, because in Korea, very often you're called by your child's name. Of course, yes. Like you'll be a Jiwapa <laughs> or Eliapa, yep. meaning you're, you're Gio's dad or Ellie's dad. Uh-huh. And so in this case, she's arguing with Turtle's mother <laughs> about lovesickness. You know, uh-huh. this whole thing about, you know, um, pining for love or, okay. you know, leaving your husband or wife for someone else running away, that oh, kind of thing. Oh, and they're arguing about that. Yeah, and she's obviously quite vexed about her own situation mm. and this conversation is making things worse. Uh-oh. And then someone says to her, you know, let, let Yongi have his fling. It's fine. You know, he's he's bringing home the bread, bringing home the bacon. He's he's earning the money. If he wasn't there, you'd be in trouble. And Turn every man's eye. like that. Okay. You know, they're all they're all running off and having affairs. Oh dear. So uh, she leaves. She's fuming, and she gets home and discovers surprise, surprise, Yongi's not there. Uh-huh. She's like, he's a her tavern, isn't he? He's going to be there. Oh. And she is mad. She <gasps> is mad as hell. And in a fit of rage, she runs there and decides she's going to have it out with Wilson. Wilson's place, though, is not where Yong Yi is, according no. to the story so far. Exactly. Okay. And um, and she's banging on the gate and saying, <laughs> let me in. And Wilson's like, no, no, I didn't, I'm, 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 I'm so sorry, busy, no. Eventually, she, she has to open the gate. She rushes in. Um, and Jung, Jung Nim starts attacking her, <gasps> raining blows down upon her. Uh-oh. And Wilson's like, he's not here. Yong Yi is not here. Uh-huh. And finally, she gets some of this rage out of her. And she starts to sort of realise what she's done. And this is where our second excerpt is going to kick off. Oh, you really feel for Jung Nim. Let's check it out. <laughs> But Jung Nim Dek's rage was already subsiding. No matter how much she hit Wolsun, she didn't react. So the fight felt bland and was even becoming embarrassing. As the strength fell away from her punches, Jung Nim Dek thought, where did that man go then? And was inwardly looking for a chance to make sense of the violence she was meeting out to Wolsun. I, 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 I won't meet him again, never again. Wilson had been repeating the same thing over and over for some time while trying desperately to escape Jung Nim Dek's grip, and as Jung Nim Dek's rage subsided, the words finally reached her ears. Is that so? I heard those words with these ears of mine. All right, you harlot. If you summon my man again, even after all this, know that I'll see you to an early grave. Jung Nim Dek let go of Wilson and straightened her clothes. After that, she made a few more half-hearted threats before going out into the night. The empty marketplace was visible a little way off. Still now, not even a lone dog hung about on the road. A chill wind from the cooled-off fields dried Jung Nim Dek's sweaty neck as she hurried along the path back to the village. But her heart didn't feel refreshed. She was the one who had done the hitting, but rather than feeling like she had vented her anger, on the contrary, she felt only miserable, as though she were returning, having lost a fight. Oh, my cursed fate. If only I had a child, I wouldn't be in such a sorry state. I go! Woe is me! Passing along the paths of the fields, owned by the Jinsa Che household that stretched on and on, she bawled and grumbled in turn. Yong Yi went out to the town on market days, and Jung Nim Dek would be so impatient every time that she didn't know what to do with herself, but she didn't get mad. The tavern would be busy on market days, she had reasoned, and he had companions with him. What could he possibly do? It was when Yong Yi started not coming home at night that Jung Nim Dek's rampaging began. Because Wolsun's irises had a yellowish tint, she'd say that she had dog eyes, that they were the eyes of someone who would catch and devour men by the dozen. But although Jung Nim Dek tried hard to find fault with Walson's appearance, dissecting her with twisted eyes, her smooth skin, and greedless benign disposition meant she never appeared particularly detestable. 
The reason Jung Nim Dek cried and grumbled so as she hurried along the night road was the despair that came from thinking Wolsun was infinitely better than her, even though she was a Mudang's daughter. going to take a bloodthirsty twist. I mean, it already kind of has with all this hitting and stuff. Well, it doesn't seem that she's got it all out of her system. It seems like she's getting more depressed and down yeah, about the situation. She is, because there's part of her, you know, her self-esteem is so low. Mm. She's thinking so so little of herself. And the reason is that they've never been a good fit. Ah. Yonggi has always had eyes for Wosun. Okay, even he always years loved previous. her, but he was he was not allowed to marry her, mm-hmm. and so he was settling for Jung Nim. And Yonggi arrives back home the next day. <laughs> Jung Nim is shouting and screaming at him, interrogating him. He's like, "No, I went to the party, had a few drinks, slept at the village pagoda. It was too hot outside, so you know, just you know." Uh-huh. And she says nothing about what she did. Okay, he doesn't know. Uh, meanwhile, a friend asks Yonggi to give two blouses she's made to Wosun. And oh, he goes not to... good. He well, shouldn't be meeting Wosun, should he? Well, the rest of them are like, it's okay. fine, you know, it's a fling. <laughs> but when he goes to see her, she doesn't come out, doesn't answer. Oh. And she's never been like this before. And then he notices the, the gate is nailed shut. Oh. And an old woman who's passing by, a Halme, tells him, oh, I heard she ran off with the Kangwon Jinseng trader. <gasps> and Yonggi's like, what? Uh-oh. He does not believe this. Okay. It can't be true. He can't understand why she would do that. He's upset, goes for a drink, but he's inconsolable, and he ends up heading home to bed. He's lovesick. Aww. Doesn't talk to Jung, Jung Nim that night. Next day, doesn't respond to her, and still she starts, until she starts pushing him and taunting him about Wosu. Oh. And then they both fly into a rage. <gasps> That's not good. And the thing is, when you get angry, the truth comes out. And what she did to Wilson, that spills out of her mouth. Well, he's going to find out, surely. Hmm? He was going to find out. He was going to find out, but it's in this moment. Uh. He grabs her by the hair, pulls oh. her, throws her to the ground, what? and then staggers off in a daze. Surely he could understand his wife being angry. But he's lovesick. Mm. And so... He's at this point, he's just, he's in his own head. He doesn't know where he's going. He starts walking up into the mountains. Um, and he's thinking about what has happened. He's thinking how it's all his fault. How oh, he's to good, blame good for Wilson's m- misfortune. Um, and how, how they were separated that once. And how she was always so pure. She always said, I would never be a Mudang. Never, even if you don't marry me, marry someone else. But I'm still not going to be a Mudang. Oh. And he blames himself. A day later, he staggers back down the mountain. <laughs> he collapses by one of the village shrines. People are trying to talk sense to him, but he's just mumbling, mumbling, mumbling about Wosun and sort of eventually collapses. And that's where our final reading will take place. (laughs) Terrified, thinking he must be dead, Dori shook Yongi violently, and only then did he manage to open his eyes don't don't shake me so I, I don't have any energy that's all you gave me such a fright what did you come up here for now then come up onto my back Dory pulled one of Yongi's arms over his shoulder and heaved him onto his sturdy muscular back Yongi was tall and Dory was short but he was a strong man Dory made it back down to the village without too much trouble I'd better go and get the doctor. Even healthy people get weak come midsummer. What were you thinking going up into the mountains? Don't worry, Yongi said, all light gone from his eyes. My insides are still intact. I'll be all right if I have something to eat. When they got close to the house, Yongi mumbled, Why would I come back here? Is there no place for me in the world but here? Dori said, What was that? I said, It's a funny sight. A man who left after hitting his wife, being carried back home. Yongi's usual way of speaking had returned, but his lips were contorted into what looked like a smile of deep grief. Jung Nim Dek was lying down with the door wide open and her loose hair spread out in disarray. The empty earthenware pot was still on the lid of the big sauce jar, untouched. Look here! Pretending not to have heard Dori call her, Jung Nim Dek made no move to sit up. Look here! Something terrible happened! What's happened has happened. Terrible or not, don't bother me with it. 
pretending she was just rolling over in her sleep. Jung Nimdek peeked outside. When she saw Yongi being carried in, she couldn't hide a look of bewilderment, but she just lay there. Hurry and get up! Your husband collapsed on the mountainside! Hurry up and put out bedding so I can lie him down! Having figured out from Yongi's words that they must have had a fight, Dori deliberately made a fuss. Unable to win out, Jung Nimdek sat up and gathered her untied hair together to tie it back. You should have left him to become a wandering ghost. Why would you carry him all the way here? That's a bit much, isn't it? With someone in this kind of state, it's no time to talk like that. And with a grunt, Dori put Yongi down on the maru, then pulled down the end of his sleeve to wipe the sweat from his forehead. Yongi's body had returned home, if little else. This is a sad, sorry situation, isn't it? It's anti-white day. Yes, it <laughs> does feel that way. True love has not won out, it seems. Um, so, yeah, his body's returned. His heart isn't there, is it? Yeah, he's not dead, but I think his soul's taken a beating. <sighs> um, he's absolutely heartbroken. Yeah, well, yeah, of course, you can feel for him a little bit, but he's the one having an affair. And I feel for his wife as well, who's flown off in that rage as well. She's not the nicest of people, though. No. I mean, you beating. look at her fits of anger. <laughs> they were not in a good relationship. And mm. I'm not, I'm, I, you know, it's, it's very hard to judge people, especially when they're fictional characters. Yes. Um, but the point is, they were not happy together. They've no. never been happy together. This was a, this was an ill-fitted match. Absolutely. Tigger is saying uh, about the fit of rage anger is a powerful truth serum it also causes stupidity and somehow i think the wife would still have been jealous even if there wasn't an affair there yeah she doesn't come off great in this story either, does no she? no they're two very unhappy people mm. um and what i really like about this story it's a very it's a very sad story it's a tragic tragic story of a romance gone wrong is that it highlights just how unhappy some marriages can be when people marry for the wrong reasons. Yeah. When they marry because society wants them to, as opposed to marrying because they really want to be together. Yeah, and when parents get involved and, you know, say that's not the right person for you, to be honest... I think it happens a lot less these days, but I think it still happens more here than maybe in the West. Yeah, and I think if you if you come from a family with money, there's even more pressure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. if you're just an ordinary guy, an ordinary girl, let's you know, I think you're a lot more freer in terms of your relationships. Mm. But you you there are still marriage brokers out there. Yeah, there are there are people who will set you up with someone fitting of your status. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting for me is that it's also highlighting the issue in the 20th century of the shunning of the mudangs, the mm. shunning of the shaman, yeah. um, where society, they were once really central to village life, really respected. Sure. And then in the 20th century, things took a really dark turn for them. Yeah, um, it's interesting, right? What I really like about it as well is the theme is lovesick. Mm -hmm. But for me, it ties into a very Korean cultural aspect to do with shamanism, which is the shaman sickness. Shaman sickness. Are you aware of this? No. Um, th there's there's an idea that um, often shamanism is passed down uh -huh. from mother to daughter. Yes. But also that if you do not become a shaman um, and you're meant to be a shaman, at some point this sickness will overtake you. Oh, and wow. the only way to cure that sickness is to become a shaman and to be in contact with the spirit world. Oh, goodness. So, I didn't know that. That's interesting. I, I have a good friend, and we will always make fun of her because she had a, a her grandmother mm. was a mudang. Oh. And uh, she <laughs> always got sick, and we would keep saying, you sure, you sure it's not the shaman sickness coming on? <laughs> um, yeah, so so this idea that 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 Walsun is tainted mm. or could be tainted by the shaman sickness, but in fact, it's a different sickness. It's a love sickness. Yeah. It's like the curse is not on the shaman. Mm. It's on the man who should have married her. Oh, that's an interesting flip of this. In this really short story as well, we must say, that film at the moment that's doing really well has to do with shamanism. Exhuma. Right? Yeah. yeah. Have you seen it? I, I've not seen it yet. I've heard very, very good things about it. It's your alley, surely. Right? Yeah. yeah. I'm really Spooky. looking forward to it. I think, I think it's, a, it's an aspect of Korean traditional culture which is fascinating. I think in the past, Korea was very shy about introducing mm. it outside of Korea. Yeah. There was a shame attached to it. But in recent years, I think 
we're now able to talk about it, to celebrate it, to understand it more, and to appreciate it more. Yeah, like you said, that used to be central, integral to village life. And yeah, not some kind of spooky mumbo jumbo. Well, maybe there are some aspects of that, but you know, there would be more having that kind of spiritual healer role or, or link with the other side. Yeah, but you're right. In the past, I don't know. Since my mum was young, because whenever she talks about shamans, being Christian as well, I don't yes. think it helps at all. Well, this was this was the thing. There was a big push from certain Christian groups, from mm-hmm. certain churches and denominations, to demonize shamanism. Yeah. Um, uh, but that said, uh, it was in in October, I think, last year. Uh-huh. I went to the Shamanism Museum oh. to see. A shaman perform. Oh wow! It was the first time to see it live in person. What was it like? It was brilliant. There was no summoning of spirits. This uh-huh. was more about the blessing of the house and uh-huh. bringing good luck. But it was like it was. It was theatre. Yeah. We sat there for a couple of hours wow. and we were entertained with fantastic singing and jokes and talking, yeah. and it, it was easy. Seeing that to understand how vital it was to the village spirit to mm-hmm. get people together, and the the shaman was also the person who would um, solve disputes, solve yeah. arguments. If you were having a problem in your love life, a problem with your husband or wife, you go and talk to the shaman. Yes, uh, Aaron saying uh, the man's spirit broken at the end of this story. I think that's a fate worse than death, and he really should have ended it if he could. I think that was the problem, right? All the social pressure and whatnot. Yeah, like he, you said, he should have married Wilson in the first place. They were meant to be together. Yeah, the only thing he could have done then was what he was imagining in part one, like go to the mountains and just live alone yeah. there. Uh, one line review, please, Paul. A tragic tale of love that never was nor never could be meant to be. Mm, next week, what are we checking out? Oh, I'm excited. Next week, I've got the book in my bag. I'm reading it right oh. now. It is Your Utopia by Borda Chung, translated by Anton Herr. If you liked Cursed Bunny, you'll oh. love this one. It's another anthology of short stories. Um, I've read the first one. It's brilliant. I'm not sure which one I'm going to feature on the show yet, okay. but I'm, I'm guessing they're all going to be great. Fabulous. Thank you so much for your beautiful readings as ever. Uh, thanks as always to the Literature Translation Institute of Korea for help with copyright permission. Thanks to Park Jung-Ni for her brilliant story and Sophie Bowman for her excellent translation. I'll be back next week with another day. Bye-bye. You can listen to Check It Out with Paul Matthews on Adidang Radio's Hashtag Daily K every Wednesday from 10am KST.